So let's have a look at some end of the road stuff. Uh, one of the things I did when I was here was study the ultimate size of the human head, the human brain, and how much smarter might we get. It turns out that there are physical limitations. If you have a head that's too big, there's a problem with the birth canal. If it gets to about beyond about half a metre uh, across, when you stop walking, your brain keeps going, crashes into the front of your skull, and you knock yourself out. So there's all sorts of mechanical limitations. But one of the key ones is that getting the blood in, the fluid in, and getting the fluid out needs a huge arterial capability. And as you expand the size of the brain, uh, the arteries uh, and, and, and the, the whole of the pipe work to get fluid in and out starts to cut down on the amount of interconnection inter space. And when you plot the capacity of the human brain, it comes up and goes over the top. And interestingly, uh, on one side is the female, which is a smaller brain, and the male, which has got the bigger brain. And what really fascinated me was that Neanderthal man was right at the peak at about 15% bigger than we are right now, and we wiped him out because we were smarter and he was a little dumber. So it, it, it soon becomes apparent that we've peaked. Now, people are doing things like implanting chip work into people's brains. They are connecting into the human uh, nervous system and trying to augment capability. And it's working really well. And you see a lot of this for uh, paraplegic, quadriplegic, and, and people with um, real difficulties in life. But it's also being done by people who are trying to push the, the edge. The other thing that's being done, and the American military are doing this, is, uh, if, if you like, uh, Viagra for the brain. They have got chemical programs that will whip your IQ up by 20% for 36 hours, and then you collapse. So if you're going into battle, and they give you a quick shot, you become 20% smarter, but you're not going to last very long, which is, which is great. But, but it's such an insignificant enhancement that it's not really going to help. So hence my, if you like, vision that we're going to have to have some kind of symbiotic relationship that allows us to leverage uh, the machinery. So I now did a, a little uh, experiment and looked at robot threat, 1.8 million, and robot benefit, 2.15 million references. So these are articles for and against robots. And it seems that we're pretty ambivalent. It seems to be right down the middle. What then cracked me up was that when I went to humanoid robots, I got an offer, would you like to buy one? <laughs> Which I totally didn't expect. You know, it's like, geez, really? So this stuff is now starting to appear on the market in various guises. So uh, has everybody seen this one? Uh, this is a, a pretty cool machine. Being able to uh, walk as, uh, is a, a difficult thing to do. Uh, has anybody seen these? This is the Sigourney Weaver man magnifier kind of suit. There are several of these in America being developed for the military. They're being developed in Japan and Australia. And uh, if you imagine a nurse in a hospital being able to lift uh, somewhere between two and five times her own body weight with ease, uh, the number of sustainable back injuries is going to fall. And, of course, for the military, it means you can carry a lot more weaponry and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they're very, very powerful uh, systems. So uh, th th this one needs a bit of explanation. Uh, this is a robot doing uh, an operation on a human being. It turns out that a lot of eye operations are now being done by computers or computer-driven systems, machines. For the simple reason, human beings do not have the visual acuity or manual dexterity to do a good job. How many people would buy furniture made by a human being? Bad decision. Human beings make really crap furniture. You know, if you want really good furniture, get a machine to do it. You wouldn't buy a car built, built by human beings. You won't buy a computer built by human beings because human beings can't build them. So a lot of the stuff that we now hold a wristwatch human beings can't build anymore. So it's kind of interesting that there's a sort of turnaround where we're taking the technology and feeding it right back around. Um, people get really windy about this. The reality is if you have the misfortune to have to have um, a hip operation, most likely it's going to be done by a robot. And the difference between a human being and a robot uh, replacing a hip 
is that the one done by the robot will last three to five times longer because of the precision. Um, it'll grind out um, of the mandrel and the, the fit of the, of the taper is superb. When a human being done it, it's all sloppy. So, so it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, some of it's counterintuitive. But the reality is you get a bit upset by these things because they look mildly uh, menacing. We see technology as a threat, but we tend to remain really quite complacent about the biology. And I, don't, I personally don't see uh, a lot of difference. Uh, it's a system, and uh, the only thing that you can say is uh, the system's been running for 1.8 billion years, and if it could create anything nasty, it's probably already done it, or if it's not done it yet, we know more or less what strain and what form it's going to be. So here's an unusual view. Um, uh, there was the Big Bang, particles, atoms, molecules, biological forms, and life. And on the way up, crystals, fluid, bulk materials were created. The life form, us, created artifacts and tools from those crystals, fluids, and bulk materials. And what did we do? We went upwards into space and created artificial intelligence and artificial life systems and hurtled downwards into electronics and materials and biotech and nanotech and what have you. Now, here's a sneaky thought. A sneaky thought is perhaps when the genome got to the end of 1.8 billion years, it looked at humankind and said, well, that's about it. You know, we're so slow at random mutation. Uh, evolution is so slow. Perhaps we should speed things up a bit. So I will now make humankind so smart that they'll get a screwdriver, come hurtling back down the chain to the very small and start twiddling the genome, and then we'll really get a move on. It's kind of a perverse thought, isn't it? I'm not sure it's that intelligent, but it is a consequence of that creation of life. So we are now twiddling the very matter that created us in the first place. When is it going to stop? That Intel 2008 was only announced this week. They've now got uh, transistors with ten, 10 nanometer feature size in a production scale capability. Now, in 2006, they were saying, that's about it. We don't think we can go any further than this. And then all of a sudden, they leap by almost tenfold in their capability. And if you look back through the history, they keep doing that. We can now manipulate atoms one at a time. And just to put a little sort of peg of reference in here, uh, science never does this. We never, ever get a complete understanding or a complete model. There is always uncertainty. For three million years, the human race has been at the top of the evolutionary ladder. Oh, God. Nothing lasts forever. Kind of a chilling thought, but...